If you found Mark 12, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Mark chapter 12. I'll take you to verse 18, and then we'll read from there. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 18. <clears throat> And Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. They asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died left no offspring. And the second took her. He died, left no offspring. And the third, likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason This is not the reason that you are wrong, because you know neither the Scripture or the power of God. When they rise from the dead, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Join me as we pray. Father, we pray that you would help us today. There are sons and daughters of God purchased by the blood of Jesus in this room that need healing and hope and strength and endurance. I pray that you would provide that. There are men and women here that have a faith in God and yet have have not surrendered to Christ. Spirit of God, I pray that you would bring that. And all of us here need to grow deeper. So Father, we ask you to help us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> when I was 26 years old, Connie and I moved to pastor our second, our second church. Our first church was started after six weeks of being married when I was 23. Second church, I was 26, went to it in Amit County, Mississippi. The name of the church is Thompson Baptist Church, and it's still doing well today. Thompson Baptist Church was close to Liberty, Mississippi. Liberty, Mississippi is best known for a storyteller and comedian named Jerry Clower. Jerry Clower actually lived right down the road from us on Route 4, Liberty, Mississippi. From time to time, uh, he would come to our church for special events. He was friends with several people in the church that I was serving. So he would come there and uh, get to spend a little time with him. First time I ever met Jerry Clower... I was dressed up in my best white starched shirt, had a necktie on. He said to me, son, you look like a Mormon missionary. (laughs) Next time I met him, I was uh, at the Ford dealership in Macomb, Mississippi. I was uh, younger and stronger back then. Evidently, he had forgotten we met. And I met him again, and he patted me on the shoulder and said, son, You're built like a government mule. I don't know if it's better being a Mormon missionary or a government mule. Jerry Clower tells the story of Marcel Ledbetter going to visit his uncle in Chicago. Marcel never been on a jet airplane. Got his ticket and went on to the airport there in Jackson, Mississippi, flying out of Jackson, Mississippi. Scared to death. Marcel sitting on the plane with his Bible on his knee, praying, reading the Bible. man across the aisle looks over and says to Marcel, hey, are you one of those Bible thumpers? Marcel said, I don't know if I'm a Bible thumper or not, but I believe every word in the Bible. 
The man said, surely, surely you're not dumb enough to actually believe that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish and spent three days in the belly of a fish. Marcel said, I believe every word of the Bible. If God said it, then that settles it. The man said to Marcel, well, you ain't ever going to know for sure about Jonah. Marcel said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him. The man said, well, what if, what if Jonah ain't in heaven? Marcel said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> Skepticism. Skepticism. We live in a world that is skeptical of the God that we serve. We live in a world that is skeptical of the gospel. We live in a world that is skeptical of the church, of the Bible, a world that is skeptical of the power of Christ and his gospel. In fact, that's what we see right here in this passage. Skepticism. Last week, Kyler showed us how the Pharisees and the Herodians, they came to Jesus and they came to trap him with a question about taxes and about the government. Jesus, of course, confounded them and they walk away frustrated. So another group is here in our passage this morning. Another group is here called the Sadducees. Sadducees. They've shown up and they're skeptical. They are seeking to publicly discredit the Lord Jesus. But, of course, Jesus is too skilled for that. Here in this passage, he reminds us that a skeptical world, a skeptical world needs deep Christians. This world we li live in needs you to be more than just a church attender. It needs Christians, men and women, that know what we believe and why we believe and what is the, the, the ground that we stand on. Tell you what I want to do today. I want to go through the passage. We do this a lot, but it may be a little extended today. I want to explain some of the passage uh, and just kind of like a run-in commentary almost. And if you'd like to write things down, it's fine to do that. Uh, just so you get a feel for what's happening in the story. And then let's come back and uh, we'll make some application. Would you join me there? Verse 18. If you're writing, I just put verse 18, the Sadducees. Tells us in verse 18, Mark says that the Sadducees came to him. Who are the Sadducees? First time you see the word Sadducee in the book Mark, in fact, it's the only time they are mentioned here in Mark. When you think of Jewish history and what are the leaders in Judaism at the time, you have four groups. You have the Pharisees, you have the Sadducees, you have the Essenes. That's probably John the Baptist might have been part of their group. And then you have the Zealots who want to overturn the government. Pharisees are the largest group, 150 times in the Gospels you see them show up. They're, they're like they're everywhere. Sadducees, only 15 times. The name Sadducee probably comes from the high priest during David's time, Zadok, Zadok the priest. We see them for the first time in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. John the Baptist is preaching, and the Sadducees come out there to where John the Baptist is, and John the Baptist says to them, Who warned you, you brood of vipers, to flee from the wrath of God? Chapter 16 of Matthew, the Sadducees, they, they came to test Jesus. Matthew tells us to, they wanted a sign. After the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came, the church is born. Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 4. And while he preaches in Acts chapter 4, the Sadducees are annoyed because Peter is preaching the resurrection in Jesus. Acts chapter 5 or 17, uh, we find out that the high priest and the Sadducees, they rose up against the apostles. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, Luke wrote the book of Acts, tells us in Acts chapter 23 a little, a little bit about the Sadducees. This is really all we know. We get it from Luke. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. This is Acts chapter 23, verse 8. There's no resurrection. What do they believe? No resurrection. They don't believe in angels. There are no angels. They don't believe in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the only Bible that they have are the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All of them written by Moses. They only believe in what Moses wrote. 
We also know from context they are close to the Roman occupiers, the government. So, so put it all together, we know they are worldly, they are wealthy, they are powerful, they are pragmatic, and they can't stand Jesus. Verse 18, the Sadducees came to Jesus and they asked him something. Verse 19, they address him as teacher. Maybe they're being respectful. Probably they're being sarcastic. And in verse 19, they start this ridiculous parable designed to mock Jesus. And they use something Moses wrote. Let me read it to you, verse 19. It's called the Leverite, Leverite marriage. Leverite comes from the Latin word lever, which means brother-in-law. That's what this is, verse 19. Teacher, Moses wrote for us, and this is Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. If a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So that is something God gave the people of Israel, that if a young man marries a young woman and they're starting their new life together, but tragically before they can get started and have any children, the husband dies, then if there is another brother who is available and not married, he is to marry the widow so that the name continues beyond that day and time. So that's the Leverite marriage. That is there to propagate the name in Israel. And we find it in Genesis 38, if Judah and Tamar had kept to the Leverite agreement, there wouldn't have been a scandal. If you read the book of Ruth in your Bible, you've got the book of Ruth there. The entire book of Ruth is written around this agreement in Deuteronomy 25. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. So they take what Moses wrote, and they're not trying to ask him really about that. They're getting at something they don't believe in. They're trying to create a scandal. They're trying to ridicule Jesus. So they make the premise, verse 19, and then listen to the, the parable. Listen, you can almost feel the sarcasm when you read it. Verse 19, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So we know that's in the Bible. So they're going to take the Bible and make a terrible application. There are seven brothers. I guess they were like stair steps going down, maybe a year, two years apart, but it doesn't matter because it's ridiculous. Seven brothers. The first one took a wife. When he died, he left no offspring. Second one took her. He died, left no offspring. Third, likewise. And you can assume they're just going to go down the line. Fourth one and the fifth one. And verse 22, the seventh one. Imagine being that seventh brother. He's a dead man walking. You don't even know it. <laughs> seventh one took her as a, as a wife, and then he died. And then eventually the wife died. So, Jesus, we've got a question for you based on all of that. You can just almost hear them laughing as they're saying this. Verse 23, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife should, will she be? Because they all had her. What a terrible, scandalous thing to say to Jesus. Jesus does not take it lightly. Verse 24, there is a brutal response. His response is, is, is brutal. Verse 24, Jesus says to them, is this not the reason that you're wrong? You know why you're wrong? You don't know the scripture and you don't know the power of God. There's a sermon right there. Verse 24 is the sermon. You don't know the scripture. You don't know the power of God. This is why you're wrong. That word wrong is Planeo, if you like the Greek words, P-L-A-N-E-O, it means to wander. It's where we get the word planet, wanders in space. This is what Jesus said. This is, why you, this is how you've drifted. This is how you came off course. You don't know the Bible, and you don't know the power of God. Verse 25, he answers the first question about marriage. They've brought it up. <clears throat> what happens after we die just gives us a hint. He doesn't go into full detail. Verse 25, what does he say? When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
but are like angels in heaven. Well, the Sadducees, remember, they didn't believe in angels. So Jesus is, is putting it to them here in verse 25. Well, now, what does it mean about marriage? Well, marriage is God's good design for right after creation. Marriage is a creation ordinance that God has given to humanity to build families that then build societies that built a world. It is there for our good, for procreation, for children. It is there as a picture of the gospel in Ephesians chapter 5. It is there for fellowship, for binding of society. But when we are in heaven, it will no longer be necessary. In heaven, he says, we are like the angels, not angels. You die, you don't become an angel. Please don't say that. You're not going to get wings. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in angels, so this is Jesus saying they're like things you don't believe in. Glorious, eternal beings that will not die, that will not sin, in heaven worshiping God, praising God. We retain our individuality. We retain our knowledge of people that we knew and relations. They're all preserved, but resurrection life is different than earthly life. What Jesus is saying in verse 25, but really that's not what you're asking. Verse 26. This is what you're asking. You're, 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 you're speaking against resurrection. Verse 26, Jesus stings them further. He takes, it's in, you got to just look at it. He takes the part of the Bible that they believe. Remember what I told you? They only believe the first five books. He takes Exodus, the second book, Exodus chapter 3. Look what he says, verse 26. As for the dead being raised, have you, this is an insult, have you not read the book of Moses in the passage about the bush? Well, certainly they have. How, how God spoke to him. God spoke to Moses hundreds of years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have lived and died. And when God spoke to Moses, he said, I am, not I was, they're dead and gone, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they are still alive. That's what he's saying in verse 26. He's not the God, verse 27, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. You see, you are quite, you're quite wrong. You're, the word quite, you're, uh, palos is, you, you're many wrong. Your wrongs are stacked on top of one another. You got wrongs falling out of you got so many wrongs that are falling out of your pockets. You got many wrongs. So what then? What then are the applications for us? I have just three. I've been, I've been traveling just back, so just I'm gonna just give you three. Here's the first one. Number one. <clears throat> Here's the first application. We need to ask the right questions. The right questions. Verse 19, following the Sadducees came to Jesus. They're asking questions, but those are not good faith questions. Those questions are distraction. They're esoteric questions of Jesus. The questions that the Sadducees ask, they say them out loud to make a point. To say more about the Sadducees than actually getting information. <clears throat> they were not seeking to know more about God. We need to ask questions like, is, is heaven real? Is heaven real? Is, is hell real? When we say uh, to become a Christian or you are a Christian, how do you describe what it means to actually become a Christian? How do you know? A question you might ask, how do you know? How do I know I'm a Christian? Or as Christians, we believe in the cross. We talk a lot about the cross of Jesus. You might ask the question, what actually happened at the cross? How were my sins expiated, taken away? How, how have I been redeemed? What does it mean that I was bought by the blood of Jesus? I was a slave to sin. Now I am a slave to Christ, a child of God. What does it mean when I say substitution, that Jesus took my place and I took his? When I say at the cross that that is where my sins, the, the propitiation for my sins, what does it mean that the wrath of God is taken away? 
What, when I say the great exchange, what do I mean by that? You believe how you are saved, that, that Christ took your sin, gave you his righteousness, that he lived this, on this earth as a man, keeping all of God's law, earning all the righteousness. He comes to you with righteousness and puts that on you and takes all of your sin and there goes to the cross and pays for that. When I say that we're adopted children of God, what do we mean? Who, who, you might ask, who is? Who is God and how can I know him? You might, you might ask a question like this, how bad is my sin? How bad is it that God would kill his son for me? You might ask the question, what does it mean to repent? What is actual repentance? Not being sorry you're caught. Not being sorry that there's damage. What does it mean to actually turn from sin and by faith turn? One of the great uh, spiritual writers of our time is Don Whitney. He wrote a book that a lot of you guys have probably read. Don Whitney wrote a book called uh, Ten Questions to Diagnose Your Spiritual Health. We probably have it in the bookstore. If it's a small book, easy to read, really helpful, I'll give you some of the questions. Ten questions to diagnose your spiritual health. First question, if you're a Christian, I'm, I'm, let me just talk to Christians now. Here's the first one. Do you, do you thirst for God? Do you thirst for God? Second question. Are you governed, is your life governed, controlled increasingly by God's word? You've put your life under God's word. Since becoming a Christian, are you more loving? Are you more sensitive to God's presence? When we gather together as a church, you come into worship, are you distracted by things or are you actually sensitive to the presence of God? Do you have a growing concern for the spiritual and temporal needs of other people? Do you care about other people's needs? The church, do you delight in the church? Do you love the church? Do you love being part of the church? Are the spiritual disciplines increasingly important to you? Do you love to worship? This, the next one, do you grieve over your own sin? Like our pastor church, 17 associate pastors, we all take our job very seriously, pastoring church trying to lead and, and disciple and and you get real concerned over the sin of people you know in the congregation sometimes you do that and forget about your own do you grieve over your sin are you a quick forgiver I mean, when somebody sins against you you think about how God has forgiven you and, and your, your sin is much worse against God than somebody against you do you yearn for heaven? Do you, do you want to be with Jesus? All of these questions are designed to help us think through because a, a world that we live in, the skeptical world that we live in, sees Christians and thinks are hypocrites. And the world we live in needs deep Christians. To get there, we need to ask the right questions. Let me give you something else to consider. It's verse 24. We'll spend the rest of our time. Verse 24. Here's the second point. We need to get more Bible, more Bible. Let me show you what, what I mean. Verses 19 and following, the Sadducees ask this crazy question. It's, it's just designed to mock Jesus, and Jesus returns it to them, and he says, you got two problems. Verse 24, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason that you wonder that you're wrong? Because you know neither the Scripture nor the power of God. See how he answers them? Let's just take the first half of verse 24. You don't know the Bible, he says to the Sadducees. R.C. Sproul, a great uh, preacher and teacher of another day, died just a few years ago. A lot of his books are still out there. Probably have some in the bookstore. You can download podcasts, listen to him teach. R.C. Sproul says that 100% hundred percent of theological error happens because 
we are ignorant of the Scripture. A hundred years ago, J.C. Ryle, the bishop in England, J.C. Ryle points out that when you just walk through history, you think about, if you read the Bible, Josiah's reforms, King Josiah's reforms happened when somebody found the Scriptures. Or if you come into Christian history, the dark ages of Christendom. Look, I just came from Rome. I saw this with my own eyes. The dark ages of Christendom result because people are held back from the Bible. Or the Protestant Reformation. You know what, why the Protestant Reformation came about? It was affected by the translation and distribution of the Bible. Martin Luther translated into common German, printed it on a printing press, and put it everywhere. Look, the churches that are going to survive and thrive in 2024 and following, churches that are strong and healthy and doctrinally clear, they're the ones that honor the Bible. You don't have to look far. You look at what's happening with the United Methodist Church. And the reason that they are falling apart is that they've lost a view of the Bible. They've lost what the Bible says. The nations, look, the nations that are moral, I, I, nations can't be Christian. Individuals are Christians. People are Christians. But nations can be underneath and be flavored by the Bible. Nations that are most moral are those where the Bible is actually known. Families that are godly are centered on the Bible. Marriages that flourish, they're built on the Bible. Solid Christian men and women that you know, you know are holy, walking with the Lord, their lives are founded on the Scripture. The more this book is known, the better our world will be. Why? Because the Bible teaches us. I say it every Sunday. Every Sunday I say this. The Bible teaches us the gospel. What is the gospel? If you're a guest, first time, this is, what, this is how you're saved. Let me explain to you what the gospel is. The Bible teaches that we are created. You're created in the image of God. The image of God in your life is disfigured because of sin. Sin has made it so that we are separated from God, that it's not just mistakes we make, that we're actually criminals in the courtroom of God, that he must punish our sin. But God doesn't leave us in our condition. He's also a good and loving and kind God, and he gives us his son, Jesus. If the first Adam fell into sin and we inherited all of that, the second Adam, Jesus, comes and lives perfectly. It's important you get this. Jesus Christ lived as the perfect human, and he kept all of God's law. He earned righteousness doing that. And when he goes to the cross and you believe in Jesus, what you are believing is all of your sin goes on him, all of his righteousness comes to you. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible teaches. So that when he dies on the cross, he dies in our place. God raised him from the dead to show there is victory. And if you trust in Christ and Christ alone, that only the cross of Christ will save you. The Bible says you become a child of God. What does the Bible teach? That's not the only thing the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the gospel not only saves your soul, but the Holy Spirit in you it's going to give you the ability to endure, endure suffering. People will say sometimes that God doesn't put more on you than you can handle. That is a lie. God puts more on your life than you could ever handle, so you call out to him and see he's the one that provides. God gives you the ability to not only be reconciled to God, to be reconciled to other people. You can forgive people of things that you never thought you'd get through. God didn't. The Bible teaches that God gives us the Holy Spirit for, for healing damaged, wounded souls. God can, can make you love the unlovable. Look, all of these things add up to a, a, a depth into Christianity. And a skeptical world needs deep Christians. You got to ask the right questions. Second thing. We've got to get more Bible. Let's go back to verse 24 for the third point. Number three, we need to trust the power of God. Look, I want you to trust that God will do it. I'm sure where I get that. He corrects them and says in verse 24, Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? 
because you know neither the Scripture or you don't know the power of God. You don't know that God works. Look, so many of our fears, so many of our anxieties are a result of this second issue. That we don't trust the power of God. That God is going to get you through it. We end up living our lives as, we're, as if we're somehow in the grip. As if we're somehow in the grip of this evil world. We forget I mean, if this, if, if this is the God you believe in, we forget the transcendent power of God. You take the book that's open in your lap, open it up to the first page. In the beginning, God created each, He created the earth out of nothing. You go and read the second book of the Bible, Exodus, and God takes His people out of slavery and destroys His enemies. Read the story of Joshua and the people walking around the walls of Jericho, falling down. Get to the prophets in Ezekiel 37, an Old Testament view of the resurrection. I've just been reading my own daily devotional. and just got through Daniel. Don't, don't throw that over into the, a children's rhyme. Read the book of Daniel and, and see the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into a fiery furnace that was so hot that burned up the soldiers that threw them in. And the king that, that was punishing them, seeing them in the fiery furnace with one that looked like a son of man. Think about the stories of Jesus healing the sick and calming the storms and purchasing us. Think about Paul preaching the gospel. And what does Paul say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16? Paul says, I am, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it, the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everybody who believes, Jews and Gentiles. Look, I want you to, I want you to trust the power of God, the power of God to save you. If you're already a Christian, then I want you to trust the power of God to strengthen you. I want you to trust the power of God to sustain you, even if it's a miracle, to sustain you. Ask God for a miracle. Maybe your heart is so damaged. I want you to look to the power of God to trust that he will heal you, that the, that that God works the miracle of reconciliation and seeing people come back together, that God has the power to forgive and help you forgive, as you grow deeper, you will grow stronger and God will be glorified. Skeptical world we live in and a skeptical world needs deep Christians that trust the power of God. What do you, before we pray, what do you need him to do? What do you need God to do? Will you trust the power of God to do that? With your heads bowed this morning, let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer before we close. With your heads bowed, I'd like to just invite any of you that, that want to come and have a pastor pray with you. We're going to sing our song. This is an invitation song. If you'd like to come and pray and just ask God, maybe you want somebody to pray with you, maybe bring a friend and pray with you, and you want to ask God to heal, to strengthen, to save. Maybe you have somebody you're praying for, you want to ask God to save them. Now, now's the time to do that. Ask God, even, even if it's just you stay where you are, ask God and trust the power of God. Father, we thank you for the word that you give us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit in us. Lord, I pray for hope and help today. We want to be Christians that have a depth and texture. I pray you would help us with that. We pray that you would work miracles, things that go beyond anything we can do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.